Black Talk Media Project would like to invite you to become a member of the BTR Community subscription-based social media platform. BTR Community is a platform that was set up for the listening audience of Black Talk Radio Network, the number one independent black radio network online. For just $24 per year, your subscription gives you access to an interactive space to share information with like-minded people with your privacy guaranteed. Your subscription will go a long way to help us maintain and improve our current media platforms. It will also help provide a budget so that we can begin the task of establishing localized media centers and radio stations across the United States. The best way to show your support and appreciation for what we do here at Black Talk Radio is to subscribe. Help us to help you be informed. Join btrcommunity.com today. The views and opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Lift your eyes up, let your wise rise up, see the signs of the times if it's time. Rise up, rise up, when death and hell dwell among all God's people. When those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil. When the feast that feeds you starves our father's children. When snuff porn and pedo forms begin to get top billing. Rise up, when famine claims millions. When justice gives blind eyes to billions. When the Lord's anger is no longer feared. If his protection is gone and your enemies are near. If you've seen the sea spill over and the mountains shake, break, and fall. If the moon ever turns blood red and you can't see the sun at all. Rise up, no matter if the... Peace and welcome to New Abolitionist Radio on the Black Talk Radio Network, a program that seeks to educate, inform, and agitate on the issue of 21st century legalized slavery. <clears throat> Hosted by social activist and spoken word poet Max Parthas and Black Talk Media Project founder Scotty Reed. On this program, we discuss recent news on legalized 21st century slavery and human trafficking as it is practiced through the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, along with projects and people who help combat it. <clears throat> Today is the August 15th, 2018 live broadcast of New Abolitionist Radio. We don't have a lead story. All of it is equally rotten acts of slavery, human trafficking, and terrorism perpetrated by 21st century slavers under the cover of law. The good news is, I'm back and I'm ready to go. <laughs> On and near this day in history. On August 15th, 1824, freed American slaves formed the country of Liberia. The founding of Liberia in the early 1800s was motivated by the domestic policies policies of slavery and race in the United States, as well by, as by U.S. foreign policy interests. In 1816, a group of white Americans founded the American Colonialization Society, ACS, to deal with the problem of growing numbers of free blacks in the United States by resettling them in Africa. The resulting state of Liberia would become the second, after Haiti, black republic in the world at that time. On August 20th, 1619, the first enslaved Africans were brought by the Dutch to the American colony of Jamestown. This began a slave trade that would last centuries and affect hundreds of millions of lives up until this day, right here, right now. In Direct Action News, a nationwide prison slave labor work strike is being called for on the August 21st through September 9th, beginning just six days from now. If you know someone on the inside, tell them what's going on. If you want to help from the outside, contact organizers at imweubuntu at gmail.com. The Right to Vote campaign, it needs your support. 
It's a nationwide campaign being initiated by people currently confined in the United States. This campaign grew out of the August 21st national prison strike demands, specifically point 10, that the voting rights of all confined citizens serving prison sentences, pretrial detainees, and so-called ex-felons must be counted. Representation is demanded. Our abolitionist in profile tonight is Benjamin Rush, 1746 to 1813, the most prominent American physician of the late 18th century. Our rider of the 21st century Underground Railroad today is former Black Panther Robert Seth Hayes. He has been released from prison after 45 years behind bars. As always, we have a little time and a lot to cover, so be sure to follow the information we provide on our Facebook page at New Abolitionist Radio so you can see it in real time as we talk about the stories. Also remember to support our efforts by joining us as a member at community.blacktalkradionetwork.com. I'm not joking when I say we need your help and your support to continue. You'll find links for today's program on our abolitionist planning page, which is available to BTR community members. If you have a question or comment, you can call in today at 704-802-5056. That's 704-802-5056. You can chat with us and others by logging in at uberconference.com slash Black Talk Radio Network. Once again, I'm Max Parthas. What's happening, Brother Scotty? Hey, I'm good, Max. It's good to have you back on this broadcast. And I have to say you sound a whole lot better than you did when you were having a bout with your health last week. So I'm just glad to have you back, man. Yeah, well, you know, I said a little bit about what it was last uh, the last time I was on. I'm dealing with something that I've been dealing with for years, and it, it's just progressing naturally, which is a bad thing. And my, my ability to move has been restricted greatly as of late. I, I'm walking around with those, you know, those crutches that attach to your arm and then you hold them there. That's the type of way I got to move around now, so it's difficult. But there ain't nothing wrong with my voice, <laughs> and I can speak very well. So I'm using my voice to make change. You know, you um, mentioned Liberia and how it was founded. And while you were reading that, I was just thinking about that's the power of white supremacy. Uh, besides Haiti, as you mentioned, it is the only nation that was established made up of former victims of slavery. Of course, we all know uh, the Haitian Rebellion and how that came about. But Liberia, that's the power of white supremacy. What is the power of white supremacy? Because a lot of people have different definitions. And to me, what I was thinking at that time is wealth, power, and influence. That That is the power of white supremacy, which we know some may not agree, but we're not looking for 100% agreement. But white supremacy is an outgrowth or a symptom of the disease of slavery. And I'm talking about on this continent, on this North American continent. White supremacy, American white supremacy, is rooted in the institution of slavery. And, you know, when we look at the immigration debate today, and a lot of these people that are being locked up on these private prison plantations are not immigrants, they're refugees. It's a difference between refugee and an immigrant, and people should look up and see the difference in the definition. But Liberia, they did not want the, they were concerned about the growing numbers of black people in this country and what that might look like, you know, in the future. Are we not hearing the same thing today? You know, I saw some reports with Laura Ingram and I think it was Tucker Carlson and they were talking about, I heard Tucker, Tucker Carlson talking about this one town at one time was only 2% Hispanic and now it's above 50%. And Laura Ingram saying, did nobody vote on this? You know, these changes to our society, talking about the population is changing and and that and they're very fearful of becoming a minority because they think that if that that political power um is transferred to another group that they are going to be mistreated as other as their victims 
you know, flip the script on them, so to speak. So that that was the same mindset with the establishment of Liberia. You know, let's get these Negroes up out of here and, and let's ship them back off to Africa. And that's something to keep in mind. And I have nothing against anybody that wants to go to Mother Africa and live. I hope that if you do go there, you will keep in touch with us here in mainland USA and, you know, build, keep that bridge of communication open, which can lead to trade, you know, between the two continents and whatnot. But that's what I was thinking about when you mentioned how Liberia was established and the same fears that we see playing out uh, today in, in reference to non-white refugees is the same attitudes that was playing out, which established Liberia as a nation. Right, Scotty. And, you know, these were freed uh, men that they were sending to Africa. Uh, they didn't want to send slaves. It was the free people. They said there was too many of those, uh, apparently. And I can imagine as being a free black during that time, knowing that just right over the state line there, just across from you, your brothers and sisters were property. And you weren't too far from that yourself under the uh, auspices of convict leasing laws and things like that. So it was amazing. And in the beginning, it was formed by, like they said, the white men who were working with, uh, not only was it slavers was a part of this uh, this society, but also uh, abolitionists were working with them. And they wanted to solve what they called the problem of having too many free black people. And they when you, sent them when off you to say Liberia. abolitionists, caught, huh? I'm sorry, when you say abolitionists were working with them to get these free Negroes out of the country. Cause yes. that, that would be news to me. Now I know Lincoln's role in it, but his role in it was based on his, his racism. I mean, it's documented. He said that he didn't believe that the quote unquote two races could coexist in this nation. And he did not believe in equality. I mean, if, if you want to talk about somebody who history has been whitewashed, Man, Lincoln's got to be in the top five, man. I would even say he's at the top of the list. But, you know, he was supportive of um, um, kicking these people out of the United States. Well, Lincoln is a difficult person, but he did betray everybody. As a matter of fact, that's part of something that I'm going to share with you shortly, Scotty. Um, You know, sometimes I don't want to make the mistake of assuming that people know where we're coming from just listening to one broadcast. And I want to make sure I always go to our roots about what this is all about. And today, in the way that I wanted to do that was let the former president of the United States of America, Barack Obama, explain to people what we're dealing with today. Uh, In reality, through the 13th Amendment that has been around since the uh, late 1800s and the emancipation. So it's a link in the chat room, Scotty. Uh, Unless you want to add more to this, um, and we can go ahead and listen to Barack Obama tell us about modern day slavery. It's a mixture that, and when some Abba music Pharaoh behind it. You know, I'm poetic to with my stuff. Prolong the period of slavery in Egypt. He had a favorite, favorite formula for doing it. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. Soon there will only be the conquerors. And the conquerors. Step into the spotlight. You are a good man. Step into the spotlight. It's a good heart. And it's hard for a good man to be a king. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, President Clinton, thank you for your very kind introduction. Uh, although I have to admit, uh, I really did like uh, the speech a few weeks ago a little bit better. Now, afterwards, somebody tweeted that uh, somebody needs to make him secretary of explaining things. Although it, they didn't use the word thing. Today I want to discuss an issue that ought to concern every person, person. because it is a debasement of our common humanity. 
it ought to concern every community because it tears at our social fabric. It ought to concern every business because it distorts markets. It ought to concern every nation because it endangers public health and fuels violence and organized crime. I'm talking about the injustice, the injustice, the outrage, the outrage of human trafficking, of human trafficking, which, which must be called by its true name, its modern, true slavery. name modern slavery. Modern slavery. Now, I, I do not uh, use that I word use that slavery, word. Lightly. slavery lightly. It, it evokes obviously it one of the most painful chapters in our nation's history. In our nation's history. But around the world, there's no denying the awful reality. When a man desperate for work finds himself in a factory or on a fishing boat or in a field, working, toiling for little or no pay and beaten if he tries to escape, that is slavery. When a woman is locked in a sweatshop or trapped in a home as a domestic servant, alone and abused, and incapable, and incapable, and incapable of leaving, of leaving. That's, slavery. that's slavery. When a little boy is kidnapped, boy is kidnapped turned into a child soldier, into a child forced, soldier to kill, forced to kill, or be killed, or be killed. Or that's, be killed. Slavery. that's slavery. That's slavery. When a little girl is little sold girl by her is impoverished, by family. Her impoverished family, girls my daughter's age, girls my daughter's age. Runs away from home, or is lured by the false promise of a better life, and then imprisoned in a brothel and tortured if she resists. That's slavery. That's slavery. It is barbaric, and it is evil. It has no place in the civilized world. Now, as a nation, as a nation. As a nation, we've long rejected such cruelty. Just a few days ago, we marked the 150th anniversary of a document that I have hanging in the Oval Office, the Emancipation Proclamation. And I've got the Emancipation Proclamation hanging up in my office. Uh, and if you read through it, it turns out that uh, most of it, most of the document is those states and areas where the emancipation doesn't apply because those folks are allied with the Union, so they can keep their slaves. Think about that. That's the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Which you, so here you've got a wartime president who's making a compromise around probably the greatest moral issue that the country ever faced because he understood that right now my job is to win the war and to keep, uh, to maintain the Union. Well, you know, can you imagine how sort of uh, the Huffington Post would have reported on that? <laughs> right? I mean, it would have been blissful, right? You know? I mean, think about it. Lincoln sells out slaves. Right? And there'd be protests, and you're going to run a third party guy. <laughs> In fact, I heard Martin Luther King say this one time. We were in Virginia, and we were on the balcony of, uh, of an old plantation. It was a conference center where we were having a conference, and uh, they, they set us in these rocking chairs out on the porch, and we were looking out, and it just happened that there were students from University of Virginia uh, who were doing the serving and who were cutting the grass, and it was a good summer job. And Dr. King and I and a few other preachers were laying up there drinking iced tea uh, and rocking back and forth, Look, and he said, you know, I can see that when you're sitting up here, slavery don't look so bad. <laughs> I hope you all... Oh, Max, we are back. Okay, uh, let me just uh, give the list of who was included in that. That speech by uh, former President Barack Obama consisted of a uh, speech that he gave at the Global Clinton Global Initiative annual meeting and also a 2013 conversation he had with students uh, at a university. And the final comments were by Andrew Young. 
the two part speech is joined by his uh, statement about he has the Emancipation Proclamation at his desk and uh, they join at that point. So what do you think, Scotty? Well, that very first part, I'm very familiar with that speech um, that he gave on behalf of the Clinton Global Initiative talking about slavery and human trafficking. And I clipped that and I used it in my own video that I posted to YouTube to say that He's concerned in all those people who were in attendance, including the Clintons, because, you know, it was an event held by one of their uh, different entities that they have created and enriched themselves with, um, according to some reports. But, And I was saying that they're not talking about the slavery, the modern slavery that we talk about on New Abolitionist Radio, we're talking about the 13th Amendment slavery that says that slavery and involuntary servitude shall be abolished except for punishment for crime. And that got me banned. Um, I I was on a three-day ban on YouTube for using that clip. Um, I was told because I didn't get permission from the Clintons and even it didn't matter if I was using it under the fair use doctrine, you know, which says if something's newsworthy and you're providing commentary, that you have a right to use it, especially by a public figure, especially by the president of the United States. But I suspect somebody working for the Clintons came across the video and did not like it that I was changing the subject. And saying, yeah, all that other slavery that he's talking about is already outlawed. But the United States has the most victims of slavery legally in the world. And it got me banned for three days, Max. Um, Another thing I picked up on from listening to that clip that you shared is too much laughing and joking around the issue of slavery. Mm -hmm. Nothing funny about it. Too many jokes, too much laughing, and all that crap. So those are my thoughts. Well, there's one thing I do want to point out here is the fact that he knows exactly what's going on here in the United States ever since the Emancipation Proclamation. He pointed it out clearly. The other thing is, Scotty, like you, I I was like, well, he ain't talking about the prisons and stuff like that. And then I realized, yes, he was. Uh, There was only two things that I had to struggle with uh, that he mentioned I say, how are these happening in prisons? But everything else was very clearly happening in prisons. The two things I struggled with was, well, he said that impoverished families sell their children. And then I remembered, hey, we reported here on New Abolitionist Radio that the jails are working directly with the adoption agencies and selling children right out of the jails and prisons and giving these women like 5000 or $2,000 to sell their children. And that's exactly what's happening well, in Well, Max, prisons. those two judges in Pennsylvania was getting paid by right. Pennsylvania child care. But no, Max, I'm going to disagree with you. The, the description that he gave did apply to prison slavery, but he wasn't talking about prison slavery. He was talking about global, illegal slavery and human trafficking. That's why he added the other stuff about, you know, uh, uh, impoverished family in Africa or or the Arabia or whatever selling their children. He was not talking about prison slavery. He was talking about something that's already outlawed. He gave a definition. This is slavery. And he made a statement clearly. But he was not. I I understand what you're saying, Max. And if he was talking about prison slavery, he could have used the same terms. He could have said the same. But he never once said the word prison. He He never once said the word 13th Amendment. He never once talked about unicorn. You, You and I are in agreement on that. He never talked about those things. My point is that the definitions that he gave clearly apply to the prison system as well. And I agree. So if the definition of prison uh, of slavery, then they apply right here in the United States. The other one I had the issue with, Scotty, when he was talking about child soldiers as a definition of slavery, and I said, well, how does that happen here today in the United States in our prison systems and our for-profit slavery systems? And then I remembered about how a lot of these men go in and come out uh, 
as uh, institutionalized criminals, like very violent. They live a violent life in prison. And when they come out, they're just as violent. And they go out there and you see reports in Chicago. You're 60, talking about 70, children going you know. in, not men. Yeah. You're talking about well, these boys. Well, these are people that are going to teenagers and come out yeah. 40 years later, 30 years later, 20 years later. 10 years later, five years right. later. And, you know, five five years in prison will condition you, will institutionalize you. As soon as you find out it's dog eat dog and do or die, you start changing your life. You and know, you come out with that same ideology. You know, Barack Obama, when it comes to the black community, we're kind of schizophrenic. You know, <laughs> a lot of us, we like him because of the symbolism, the power. You know, symbolism does have some power and what have you. But then there are those who pay very much attention to his policy, whether we're talking about foreign policy, we're talking about the overthrow of Libya using terrorists to destroy one of the most prosperous pan-Africanist nations in Africa. Um, he could have did a whole lot more uh, than he did. I mean, he did. I, I, see, I'll give it to him. He did more than any of his previous predecessors. OK, even though he, he like we mentioned how he said they were no longer going to use uh, contracts for federal prisons, which was a lie because that very next week after that, you know, there was a new contract renewed with the geo group and what have you. But he when he visited the prison and he talked about the evils and the harm that solitary confinement. So, I mean, it's a mixed bag, but it's like, I don't think I can give him the excuse of cognitive dissonance because this very intelligent man, this man, you know, talks about history as he talked about it in the clip with the students and what have you. And so I don't want to blame it on cognitive dissonance, but here's the thing that disappoints me the most about him. He is a direct descendant through his white mother. A lot of people struggle with that, but the truth is the truth. All right. But through his white mother, he is the descendant of John Punch, the first person sentenced to a lifetime of servitude. He was an involunt. He he was a um uh what what's the name I'm looking for? Involuntary servant. No, it wasn't involuntary. It was voluntary servitude, indentured servant. That's indentured servant. Okay. He was an indentured servant who, along with two European indentured servants, escaped and ran away. Too harsh, whatever. Then, when they caught him, the other two, the two Europeans, just got a longer sentence in, in uh, indentured servitude. John Punch in a Virginia court was sentenced to life in servitude. He was sentenced to slavery. All right. Barack Obama is a direct descendant of John Punch. Okay. You look it up. Don't take my word for it. And yet with that kind of legacy, I wonder if he's even aware of it. But with that kind of, but it's been put out by Ancestry.com, so I'm sure somebody's brought it up with them. But with that kind of legacy, you would think that that descendant of the first person sentenced through a court, because remember, 13th Amendment, slavery is through the courts, but a descendant of someone sentenced to a lifetime of slavery through the courts, you would think that he would be cognizant of that and do everything in his power to change, to amend the 13th Amendment to eliminate the slavery loophole. Now, his time in office is past. He can't be elected again, you know, due to the Constitution. You serve two terms, that's it. But he certainly could be using his influence and his newfound riches to help us with new abolitionist initiatives. It's not too late, Barack Obama. I know you follow Black Talk Radio on Twitter. I would like to think that you tune in to some of the broadcasts from time to time. Why else would you be following us? And he still follows us after all these, all this time. And so I would just like to put a message out to him 
Slavery was never abolished, sir. And you can repair your wishy-washy legacy by becoming a new abolitionist today. And I know with your charisma, with your influence, that you could bring a whole lot to this movement. Well, I don't want to get lost in a Barack Obama conversation. And I know that could easily happen because he was indeed the first black president or uh, of any sort here in the United States of America. And he has been involved in many things that we could discuss. My point with the video was showing that he uh, knows the definition of slavery, although it, albeit that he was misapplying it to things that are already illegal and not talking about the, the legal version of slavery, which is what we dealt with in this country. We dealt with legal slavery, not illegal slavery. And then at the end, to show that he clearly knows what's happening because he was a constitutional lawyer. And as he said, he's got the emancipation behind his desk and he broke down about how Lincoln betrayed slavery. And that's exactly what Lincoln did. So um, that was my point with that whole video. And then at the end with uh, Andrew Young talking about uh, him and Martin Luther King Jr. sitting there saying, you know, that I can understand how uh, slavery could be so easy sitting from here. So, you know, he overlooked a lot of things on purpose. He never mentioned, ever. I never heard him mention anything about for-profit corporate prisons. That was not in his vocabulary, ever addressing it. But he did address prisons. Or the state's use of, of, as California called them, their cheap labor pool. Right. Even when Bernie Sanders had uh, uh, put put out the... uh, Justice is not for sale act of 2015. He had nothing to say about that at all. And Bernie Sanders was clearly pointing out the for-profit prison industry and how it should be banned from the United States. Literally, that's what they were talking about in that bill. They gave them two years to pack up their stuff and go. And And, and that bill should be in. Again, a mixed bag because his administration did commission a report that came out and said that private prisons are actually less safe, less efficient, cost more money than state-run government prisons. Not that they're any better, but, you know, he did right. point that out. But again, what did you do about it other than pay, pay at lip service? Well, Scotty, what I'd like to do is open up the phone lines. If anybody wants to ask a question or have a comment, this would be a good time to do it. And then after that, I want to go to another video from the Young Turks where they were talking about how a judge now has declared that it is illegal to lock people up for being poor. (laughs) I mean, these conversations we're literally having, I don't understand why we're even having these conversations because it's happening everywhere. You should be addressing it on a national scale. But in any case, uh, it's a video. You might want to skip about the first 30 or 60 seconds where they promote their, their program and just listen to however much we want to of yeah, the for, conversation well, about w- this. Let me put the number out again because everybody doesn't know the process for getting in right. on the right. conversation. So that number is 704-802-5056, 704-802-5056. You have to hit star, star if you want to speak, and we'll see you on the board. But please watch your background noise. Uh, Max, we have a caller. All right. Welcome to New Abolitionist Radio. State your name and uh, your question or comment. 615. Nashville. Peace, poetry, and prismatic dreams. <laughs> Peace, poetry, and prismatic dreams, my sister. Welcome. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, y'all have to forgive me for a second. Um, uh, as my brother knows, um, this is Giovanni Marcel, um, Missy Garrett on Facebook. Yes. I am. Um, a prismatic dream poet and an artist of the New World Order, and I am Max Parthas's sister. <laughs> I called to bring light to a situation that goes with everything that 21st century abolitionists fight against. Mm-hmm. 
on March the 8th, 2016, in Dixon, Tennessee. Cynthia Green was brutally murdered. She was stabbed many, many, many times. Her face was beaten in to where she was almost unrecognizable. My son's little boy's mother at the time lived next door to her. And on May the 17th of 2016, my son, Anthony Garrett, mm -hmm. was arrested for the murder of Cynthia Green. My son has been sitting in Dixon County Jail for over two years now. Every lawyer that they have given him because he is poor, every public defender that they have given him, every time the evidence comes up that would exonerate my son and they're ready to go to court, they change my son's lawyer. My son's life is literally on the line. They added the death penalty a few months ago with evidence that they've had from the very beginning. This whole situation goes a lot deeper than anyone could ever imagine. There are TBI agents involved, there are Dixon County Police involved, there are investigators involved, and they are covering up the evidence that will exonerate my son. The three people who committed this crime are on the street and they're working for the police. They're not only working for the police, but they're working for the police in connection with a Mexican drug lord, a cartel. And Cynthia Green's sister came to me two days ago with the same information that I've gathered in the last two years. Everything that can exonerate my son has been covered up. And today, ICE units went into a factory in Dixon, Tennessee and gathered up the family members of Jose Garcia, who is the man who killed Cynthia Green, along with Cynthia Green's daughter, Cecilia Browning, and Stephen Wilson, Cecilia's ex-boyfriend. They gathered up his family members, and they are now going to deport them because today... Cynthia Green's sister, Renee White, went to News Channel 5 and gave them all the information that is needed to exonerate my son. They are now going to deport the only people who can tell that Jose Garcia showed up on March the 8th to his mother's house covered in Cynthia Green's blood with defensive wounds on his body. There are seven suspects in this case. Five of those suspects are white. Two of them are kin to the victim, one being her own daughter. One is fiction and illegal. Okay. Uh... I've been keeping up to date as much as I can through tribal because you've been telling her what's going on about the situation. And I, I need to ask, ha, there's two aspects of what's happening here. One is the conspiracy itself. The other is the crime on your son and him being incarcerated unjustly and unfairly and wrong. So we need to focus on getting him out, not so much as getting the government to uh, or, or, or trying to convict them of anything at this point. Let's talk about just getting him out. Have you contacted the Innocence Project uh, yet, by any chance? G? Scotty, did we lose her or me? Um, No, no, Max, we did not. Okay. All right, well, uh, G, I'm going to send you some inf some people to contact, okay? Okay. Um, the Innocence Project being one of them, they do a lot of good work. I don't know if they'll be able to solve this problem on time. I just don't know. 
uh, but we don't have a lot to work with. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you said, every time you get a lawyer, you can't afford a, a, a big when you're dealing with these uh, public attorneys who really don't have the experience or the care to deal with a problem like this. Uh, these they're public concerned. attorneys are involved. They, they, then they're involved in conspiracy. But I think we, at this point, uh, we need to start trying to find some legal help. And the Innocence Project is the first, in my mind, of people who do the that. The Innocence Project, the NAACP, the ACLU all yes. ignored me. They all ignored you. Every single one of them have ignored me. I've called for two years, and they have ignored me. The Innocence Project is the only one who even responded to me and informed me that until my son is convicted, they won't even look at his case. Right. And we know how it goes because we reported it on here. You could sit in the jail for three, five, shit. We reported on people who have been in jail for 13 years. Scotty, right? 13 years in jail without ever being convicted of anything. We know how this works. All right, well, I'm going to see what I can do to uh, get some assistance for you in this instance. That's the best that I can do at this point. I have a few friends, maybe call a congressman or a uh, lieutenant governor that I know and see if they can push some buttons okay thank you brother i know you know i know how you feel <laughs> I, i've lost a mind for 34 years you know you were there the day i lost them and you heard about it the day they came out yes so all right we'll, we'll do what we can is there anything else you wanted to add at this point everything is not what it seems that's the whole point of this program. The whole point of this program. Thank you for calling, G. I'll talk to you uh, tomorrow, and uh, we'll go through this more, okay? Peace. Peace, poetry, and prismatic dreams, sis. All right, Scotty Reed. <clears throat> Woo. Man, it strikes home more often than not. What do you think, Scotty? Any comments? Um, no, but unfortunately, you know, this just uh, happens all too often in this country, and it just speaks to the corruption of these officials. So, I mean, we report on these stories. We've been reporting on the same type of scenario playing out uh, for the past six, going on seven years. So, you know, without knowing all the details of the case and, and, you know, just hearing about it, I can't comment on the case specifically except for uh, everything that she stated we've heard in other cases as well. My nephew being framed by the government for murder. It's terrible. And they have all the money they need to do whatever they want. I've seen them prosecute people for stealing $500 and spend $10 million to freaking prosecute them. All right, Scotty. Well, let's let's go ahead to the next part. Unless there's another caller or comment, uh, let's listen to a little bit of that uh, Young Turks discussion on the declaration from this judge. Hey, guys, before we jump into our next story, I wanted to share let's how you can start. That. Just like 30 seconds worth. I'm sorry, Max. So uh, it's taken a while to get there. Perhaps moved one tiny judicial step away from modern debtors' prisons, and that is uh, thanks to a court ruling concerning the actions of the Orleans Parish Criminal District Court, which had instituted what should be something from the dark reaches of American history. U.S. District Judge Sarah S. Vance ruled that the 14th Amendment prohibits jailing criminal defendants who are unable to pay court-ordered fees and fines without giving them a chance to plead poverty. Vance found that the uh, parish we were talking about has a practice of issuing fees while ignoring criminal defendants' financial states and jailing them when they fail to pay. And so an OPCDC, uh, that's the parish judge, named in the suit estimated that 95% of criminal conduct 
convicts in the parish cannot afford an attorney, putting them at risk for being jailed upon failure to pay. And uh, for reasons we'll get into in just a little bit, they seem fully aware of the consequences of this policy that they're setting mm. up, how they will personally benefit from it, and how obviously the poorest among us will end up in jail. Where, by the way, if you're the sort of person that can't afford to pay for an attorney or for your fines and fees, you are at least prepared to spend extra time in jail, yeah. probably losing your job, maybe losing your apartment. If you have a business, you'd be losing that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not only that, I, I remember back at AJ Plus, we did a, a whole like, you know, breakdown of this, and it's just insane, right? So they call it actually um, offender funded justice. So not only is it people who are not able to pay for their, let's say it's a parking ticket, or let's say they were driving without a license or it expired or whatever, then not only is it like the, everything's piling on top, so like the, the fees increase, but at the point where you have to, let's say, do like a drug test or you have to, even spend a night in prison or wear an ankle bracelet or have a DNA, like all these different tests, you pay for that. Mm -hmm. But actually the people who are being fined, the so-called prisoners, are then further in debt and, and it's just this horrible debt spiral. And there are, on top of that, probation companies, like privatized probation companies, everyone's just making a killing off of the, like the yeah. 14th Amendment not being like applied. applied and observed, and then another Supreme Court ruling in '83 that like doubled down on that. So this is a huge, huge benefit. I mean, but like we're talking 40 states have debtor-funded um, justice or fender-funded yeah. justice, which the what judges get bone. I mean, they get rich off of. Yeah, like yeah. It talks yeah. so Vance has ruled now, changing the policy, that now judges who directly benefit from fees cannot order payment or determine who's unable to pay. They had the fees were being collected each year, put into this big fund, and then the judges were using that for benefits, paying for staff and things like that, which is just about the sickest thing it's I could such imagine. such an open conflict of interests. Yeah, so it, I mean, if you can't quite believe what we're saying, let me just be clear. The judge says, okay, you have to pay fines, and those fines go towards not just the staff salaries, but to extra benefits for the judge, which of course gives them an incentive to put more fines and right. fees, yeah. and also gives them an incentive to imprison you so that there's more consequences for you not paying those fines and fees that go straight into sometimes literally his pocket. Yeah. I mean, you can't find a bigger conflict of interest. So this ruling is really important, and I, and I hope that it gets upheld, and, and it does follow Supreme Court precedent. They were using a loophole to try to get around it, uh, and so th that leads to two more things about this that, that's really important. I have to confess that I had a little bit of privilege here. So, uh, you know, for a long time I, I, I was very poor uh, as a struggling talk show host, etc. Uh, but, but you know, I, my family is okay. It's the upper middle class, not rich, but we lived in a nice suburb off of New York, etc. And we never had. If I went to prison, I never had to worry whether my dad was going to bail me out or not. He'd find a way yeah. to bail me out, and so. I never understood enough to what degree we put mm -hmm. poor people in prison for being poor. Yep. Yeah. So, the, and there's a couple of different ways that that you do that. One is bail. So, yeah. if you're rich or middle class, you you have enough money for bail, and you're free to go until your trial. If you're poor, you sit in prison even though you haven't been convicted. So that's an absolute outrage, and that needs to be reformed. It's because it's not about the crime. It's about whether you are poor or rich. Yeah. That's the only reason why you're in jail. Because if the crime was bad enough, they'd say you can't get bail. No matter or you're what. a danger right. or you're a flight, flight risk, risk, right? That's a different category. Bail is just to, you know, to theoretically incentivize you to come back from a for a rich person. You know, five thousand dollar bail is nothing. That is not an incentive at all. For a poor person, five thousand dollar bail is totally unpayable. And that means you're going to sit in prison sometimes years before you get to this. And now there's these fines and fees. And then the second part is a lot of private companies buy the fines yep. of the government. Now, why do they do that? One, they're going to hound you to the rest of your life to collect that. But secondly, they then get the power to imprison you. They cannot imprison you for a private debt, but they can imprison yeah. you for a public debt. So they buy public debt knowing that they could use the you know the the justice system to take away your freedom to pay them money so that is it's a so that kind of oppression of the poor and and some portion and of the vulture, middle class just like like oh, micro capitalism, vulture yeah. capitalism also people will plead guilty to things that they're not guilty of because they can't afford to sit in um 
Like during the trial. They oh, have absolutely. To- so there might be a situation that this happens all the time on Rikers Island. Yeah. Actually, Ocasio-Cortez partly ran on this in her campaign because Rikers Island's in her district. Uh, where you go to a uh, prosecutor might go to a poor defendant and go, look, man, you can you confess whether yeah. you did it or you didn't do it, and you're going to get three months. If you don't confess, it's going to take you a year to get a trial. Yeah. I mean, think about so the guy right. thinks. Well, yeah. I mean, rational person doesn't want to sit yeah. in jail for a year, no matter what, even if they're perfectly innocent. Yeah. But then you have to admit that you were guilty, and then that's on your right. record, because and then that cycle so of poverty disgusting. continues. Mix. Max, we are back. Um, one of the things uh, from that video that we heard, um, state of North Carolina says that uh, state, state, what do they call that? Uh, debtors' prisons are abolished. They're not even supposed to exist, but yet the North Carolina ACLU has talked about these very same issues and have tried to take uh, some actions. My my memory is just foggy on the information that I had gotten uh, from them. But what came to my mind was Thomas Jefferson's letter to his fellow slavers talking about capitalism, talking about how his wealth increased with every um, victim of slavery born on his plantation. And I can sit there and imagine these judges that they were talking about, hey, every person that I, you know, put this this um, um, unnecessary bond on for every person I keep in that jail, I'm going to make X amount of dollars. And, you know, this is the state of Louisiana where um, you, they also, they talked about the loopholes. Again, loophole in the 13th Amendment allows for slavery, but even the sheriffs able to pocket any quote unquote excess money that's supposed to be spent on food for the prisons in this one particular story all he was buying them was like corn dogs and what have you you know spending as little as possible and then pocketing the rest and and i think one of one share was able to buy a vacation home totally legal totally he made three quarters of a million dollars yeah so (laughs) just on starving prisoners so these are clear violations. I'll have to look at the 14th Amendment, um, which is supposed to be equal protection under the law, which I'm, which they're, I imagine, saying is that it's built based on, it's not equal protection because those who are wealthy can get out and those who are not cannot, obviously, you know, who don't have any money. So it's not equal protection under the law. You know, and and so but it also speaks to other constitutional issues like excessive bills, fines and fees. Does it, it, what is that? Is that the Eighth Amendment or the Sixth yes, Amendment? Yes, that is the Eighth Amendment, which says excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Well, who gets to determine what's excessive? See, what's it for a poor person? Let's say, let's say that I make twenty thousand a year. I'm below the poverty level. All right, so five thousand dollar fine is excessive to a person. That I mean, that's a quarter of my yearly income right there. Whereas a person who's making, let's say, two hundred thousand dollars a year, well, that ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. That's not going to be excessive to that person. So who gets to define what's excessive? What's the formula to determine what's excessive? But as you have pointed out in the past, Max, the United States is what? One of the one of two nations on the face of the planet that bail. requires bail? Yes, cash bail system. Yeah. Only us and the Philippines. So that's so, all I got on that, Max. There's a couple of things here that I can add. One, I have a couple of other stories that are directly connected to this. And also, in America today, if you had to pay a $2,000 bail in one hour or go to jail, 120 million people would be in jail right now. Uh, That's excessive fees when uh, nearly half of your population 
can't afford it. <clears throat> so that's certainly excessive fees. And we won't even go into the cruel and unusual punishments because we have reported on that many times here. Well, it, it's, it's, what, well let, let me just add something to that, though. Remember, they're talking about jail, even though he kept saying prison. No, this is not prison. This is jail, unless they're transferring them because of overcrowding to a prison or something. But we're talking about jail, which means what, Max? That they haven't been convicted yet, right? Which means yes. what, Max? Which means that they're innocent, right, Max? Which means so, they're not subject to the 13th Amendment legally. Right, but they're being punished, though, for being poor. I would say sitting in a jail is punishment, isn't it? Yes, that this is uh, what what was a, allegedly abolished, you know, uh, where you had these pauper prisons. This was allegedly abolished, but it apparently has not been because the judge had to rule that it's illegal. And, you know, you was talking about investigating more about the 14th Amendment. The Equal Justice Initiative did that recently in an article just a couple of days ago that came out called Race, Voting, and a Gaping Loophole. And uh, they talk about a lot of that. And I'll just read a quote from the article. You can read the full article on New Abolitionist Radio. It says, according to the Sentencing Project, over 6 million Americans with criminal convictions cannot vote due to a patchwork of laws in 48 of the 50 states. Some disenfranchise only those in prison for a felony, while other states bar from voting anyone on probation or parole. Still others impose waiting periods or other conditions before, before voting rights can be restored. And a small number of permanent, are permanently prohibited voting with a felony conviction. Louisiana and Alabama today remain legal and political battlegrounds. The once controversial question of Negro suffrage has given way to debates over the electoral fitness of people with criminal convictions, but the racial results are still striking. 2.2 million black Americans are disenfranchised. That is one in 13 and four times the rate of all other racial groups combined. In 23 states, including Louisiana and Alabama, at least 5% of black voting age residents are banned from the ballot box. So that's the first so, story. So my question, Max, before, about that. before you, you know, bring yeah. up your other points, my question is, this is taxation without representation. If you can't vote, that means you have no representation in government, whether we're talking about state government or federal government. Now, I've only read the Constitution in its entirety maybe five times in my life, so I could be incorrect, but I don't recall any amendment in the U.S. Constitution that authorizes them to strip you of your U.S. citizenship if you've been convicted right. of a crime. Voting is, exactly. voting is is a privilege of citizenship, okay? Now, do they is the government losing its right to tax these people? Of course not. They're taxing these people. They get a job. They had to file a tax return like everybody else. They're taking stuff out of their paychecks, and what have you. So that's taxation. All right. You can only tax citizens. Right. So you, so what are they? What, what are they? What are they? they what is their legal slaves? <laughs> what is their legal standing in this country? Half citizen, quarter citizen, three fifths of citizen. What's going on here, man? And I can't, this is not, Constitution, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer. Maybe we can ask Barack Obama on Twitter or something to comment <laughs> on this. You know what I'm saying? But how can, you strip, how can you strip? Show me where the Constitution allows you to strip someone, a citizen, of their voting rights while it you're doesn't. still taxing them. Unless you're applying the 13th Amendment and this slave mm -hmm. status is continuing even beyond once they leave the plantation. It all leads to legalized slavery every time. And this is why we, we support the right to vote campaign, because I, I personally believe, and I've said this before, that when uh, politicians have to cater to prisoners, literally cater to prisoners, there will be changes. And in places like Louisiana, where you have uh, prisons out there like Angola, those are like metropolises. 
they're huge things like a city covering my tens and 20 miles in, in, in circumference. So, you know, there's thousands of people in there who could vote. And once they get a chance to vote, things are going to be changing really quickly. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But um, also, another thing comes to my mind. If they're not citizens, now I'm talking about the people that's in prison. Now, if they're not citizens, then why are you counting them in the census? I mean, and, and they do that with uh, the gerrymandering, where they right. put this prisons goes in back, communities this goes filled with back. black people that they can call residents. Right. This goes back to the argument of the three fifths clause. Unfortunately, people think that the Constitution or that had to do with they were saying that these Africans were only three-fifths human. That is not what it was about. It was about counting residents for the census because based on that census number, it, it determines your number of citizens. It determines the number of congressional reps. And not only that, but it also determines federal resources that will, in a term of black grants and what have you, money, we're talking about money, that's going to uh, uh, go to those districts for development. So that is why we find many of the prisons in rural, predominantly white areas. So, I mean, it's just a scam on so many levels, and I, I don't believe it's constitutional. And it's certainly violating human rights. It's it's not. It is a constitutional crisis. You hear them talk about it on the news in regards to amendments like the Second Amendment and stuff like that, but they never mention these. These are violated all day, every day. The Eighth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment. These are the rights of the citizens uh, that we possess. And we're supposed to be a nation of laws. And if we're violating the Constitution, we are just a goddamn chaotic group of lawless individuals where only the rich possess rights and the poor are born and bred to do nothing but serve and produce. It's just a shame. And it should people should be addressing this 14th Amendment violation, the 8th Amendment violation, the 6th Amendment violations, the 4th Amendment violations. And uh, there is another story that I, I mentioned that is uh, part of this. And these are like ripple effects that we're reporting on, things that are changing and, and being challenged. And as a matter of fact, in El Paso, uh, the ACLU is settling a case with a woman who couldn't pay $55 in bail, and they kept her for 25 days. And they sued El Paso for $60,000 for that. So this is, again, breaking ground. If you can successfully sue people, sue these uh, El Paso, for instance, for not being able to pay bail, you could do that all across the country because 95% of all people in jails right now are there because they can't afford bail. Another thing though, Max, and, and you know, I'm, my brain is just churning here, going back to the issue of jail, like, you know, your sister called in and told us the situation with her son. Been in there for two years, have not been convicted of a crime whatsoever. And, and this is, represents at least a million people across this country, you know, hundreds of thousands, a million whatsoever be, uh, but when you're in a jail and you haven't been convicted of a crime, does the sheriff come to your cell and deliver you a absentee ballot so that you can vote? Again, you ain't been convicted or nothing. You supposed to be innocent till proven guilty. So this is depriving you of your rights as a U.S. citizen. I mean, there, man, you know, people who find themselves in that situation in their families, and I'm putting most of this on these lawyers. We, you know, we send the, we, we have all these lawyers in our community, you know, go to law school and what have you. And there's just a, you know, we, we, the lawyers usually have a reputation of getting rich off of lawsuits, filing lawsuits. Well, here's a bunch of lawsuits and they're not frivolous lawsuits that could be filed. So, you know, it just gave me an idea. We got the elections coming up and I'm going to have to call the sheriff here in Gaston County. And I'm asking them, are you allowing pre pre-trial detainees to vote in the elections 
See, this is why I was having a conversation earlier. We don't understand politics. I hear people saying things won't never change and voting is a waste of time and and all of that kind of stuff. Well, if it's such a waste of time, if the privilege, the right, if you're a U.S. citizen to vote is so worthless, they wouldn't be going through all of this to prevent people from voting. So that just came to my mind, Max. I I haven't been convicted of a crime. I'm sitting in a jail. An election is coming up, which includes district court judges and what have you, and 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 you know other local officials. And I'm being I'm being denied my right to vote. That that sounds like a lawsuit to me. Well, we're gonna go deeper into this story uh, about the violation of the Fourteenth Amendment, and we're gonna look at some of the culprits behind this after we come back uh, from our break we're at the 905 mark. So we're a little late, Scotty. Is that all right? Would you take break down and listen to a clip or an ad that's being put out by the prison industries who are fighting against prison reform? Um, you're listening to New Abolitionist Radio right here on the Black Talk Radio Network, where we're talking about slavery and human trafficking, which is allowed by the 13th Amendment. We'll be right back. You are tuned in to the Black Talk Radio Network. For podcasts and live program scheduling, Visit us on the web at blacktalkradionetwork.com. Peace and welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio. Scotty Reed, if you could play that clip, it is an ad that was uh, um, given put into the Intercept article that we're reading here, and it's from the opposing forces about Governor Cuomo justice Cuomo. reform. Governor Cuomo is shortchanging our kids. In New York State, our classrooms are overcrowded and outdated. Some students don't even have textbooks. Instead of taking care of our children, the governor's radical agenda takes care of criminals. This year, he wants to hand out tens of thousands of luxury tablets to incarcerated felons in state prisons. Call Governor Cuomo and tell him he needs to get his priorities straight. Man, if that ain't some Willie Horton BS, I don't know what is. That ad bliss is the latest cynical approach effort by a major law enforcement union to stimmy and demonize prison reform by drawing on menacing and unsubstantiated claims that frame dangerous criminals as irredeemable threats, people that are apart, apart from and in conflict with the public. The campaign ask the public to call the governor's office and urge him to reverse his criminal justice reform policies, including giving 35,000 parolees the right to vote and providing prisoners with tablet computers. Like fellow New York officers uh, enforcement union, the New York City Patrolman's Be- Benevolent Association, the NYSCOPBA com- campaign, decried parole reform that has assisted the release on parole of elderly prisoners convicted decades ago as cop killers. You know, There's a whole wow. lot more to this story. You can read it on the yeah. on New Abolitionist Radio, but we could talk about this right there because that is the gist of it. Well, the way they feel about that, and I disagree uh, with them, but the way I feel about that, you know, the news came out lately about I'm not sure the exact you know, amount, but billions of dollars Donald Trump wants to create a space force, a military space force, you know, like some Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica type garbage. Billions and billions of dollars while people are living in poverty, millions of people living in poverty in this country don't have clean drinking water. Still, that's the case with Flint and many other places around the nation that have not gotten any attention. And then, you know, when we look at the situation of the schools, since they want to be so concerned about the schools and what have you, it, that's what I think about, man. The budget for the United States military right now, I think is close to $300 billion. Well, they don't do with all that money. So, you know, um, I don't share their sentiment, but I asked those same questions about the crazy money that the U.S. government spends. 
Well, there was that one point, Scotty, where they talked about how they specifically don't want 35,000 parolees to have the right to vote. And if you remember recently, there was a young woman who was arrested for voting while on probation. They're trying to give her five years right now. As you pointed out in the beginning of this conversation, Scotty Reed, you don't lose your rights because you're a prisoner. And then you don't, certainly don't use them, lose them if you're out in the public now and no longer a prisoner. And but these are violations of our constitutional rights. And this advertisement is coming from the prison industry. I want to read a quote and then tell you why that quote even exists. But well, Max, these before ads, you do, yeah? before you Fair do, Scott. we need to start inviting these type of people on to new abolitionist radio and let's have a dialogue and you know well let, let's talk about it let's debate this let's debate why you don't want parolees to be able to vote let, let's let's have that debate let's start inviting these type of people on you know certainly they have nothing to be scared of do they these are what uh are called astro turfing they don't they're not grassroots organizations they're not real people they're liars being paid by the prison industry to say these things you can't debate with somebody who's knowingly lying anyway and they have these uh, uh astroturfing groups all over the place where corporations now are forming uh what they want to appear as grassroots organizations in order to control the narrative oh i certainly can debate a liar you know in my whole <laughs> intent it's to show that they're a liar. So, yeah, they, you'd have to pay them like the prison industry t- does in order to get that conversation because that's what they do. Well, then that gives pay. us propaganda to put out against them. What is this prison or or patrolman's benevolent association afraid of? Why don't they want to discuss the issue in public? You know, I I can flip the script, but I I, I can't do that if I don't ask them. To come on, give them the opportunity to turn us down. Okay, I, I hear you on that. Well, here's the quote that I wanted to read, Scotty. It says, and it's in the same article, these ads constitute a step in the ongoing campaign of the police organizations to overturn hard-won gains in decreasing mass incarceration. Now, the reason that quote exists is because the prison industry requires bodies. The more bodies they have, the more money they're going to make. And there is no way in hell that the the prison industry, the police unions, the guard unions want to reduce their number of employed people. They're a dues-paying organization. If we have Say an instance where we find out that we need to free like a million and a half people who are unjustly incarcerated and we don't need at least 50% of the police that are there now because all they're doing is just uh, continuing slavery and enslaving people for gain. They ain't looking to let that happen. They will fight to the death. As a matter of fact, they don't want to reduce their numbers. They want to expand them. And the only way they can expand them is by putting more people in prisons and jails. Scotty? Yeah, I don't don't have anything to add. All right, brother. Well, was there any stories that you wanted to cover this week in particular? Well, the the story you have posted here in um, btrcommunity.com for our planning page in the abolitionist group. Um, Man, let me uh, reload this. Not reload it, but show these previous comments so that I could get to that first story that caught my eye, which has to do with prison reform ending 21st century slavery in the United States. And this comes to you from comdiginews.com, but and it was written by Marlo Salazar um, about four days ago, but. Again, you know, this just goes to show you that the abolitionist movement is growing. People are recognizing that the United States never abolished slavery. So I'll just share something from this article, Prison Reform Ending 21st Century Slavery in the U.S. Because words are important and it is very important that we be accurate with our words. And this is why I detest the metaphor for slavery called mass incarceration. We need to kill that. Use the proper language so that then people will be led 
to the proper solutions. We got to know what we're dealing with before we can find a solution. Okay? So it's, this is uh, Montgomery Village, Maryland. It's time for prison reform. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to our Constitution were enacted to provide freedom, due process, and voting rights to African Americans after the Civil War. Unfortunately, these have not prevented the treatment of many people of all ethnicity as slaves or indentured servants in the United States. And it is uh, uh, important to point out, as this, uh, as she does, is this a uh, Marlo? Yeah, I, I imagine Marlo is a woman's name. But as she points out, the difference, one of the difference between pre-1865 slavery and the post-Civil War slavery is before it was prescribed to Africans only. You know, skin, it was based on the skin color. Today, anybody can be enslaved regardless of your sex, race, gender, religion, national origin. Now we got slavery for all. But of course, they got their favorites who seem to have um, affirmative action for slavery for African Americans. You know what I'm saying? So it, yes. it, she goes on to say, this is not an exaggeration. The 13th Amendment, wait a minute, Max. Okay, here we go. This is not an exaggeration. The 13th Amendment clearly abolishes slavery and indentured servitude, except for people convicted of crimes. It also states that Congress would have the power to enact legislation to enforce this amendment. This exception has been used by states to suspend almost all civil rights for convicted felons and others. Most also, again, you know, as we were just talking about this very thing, about the stripping of voting rights, about taxation without representation, and what ha and and what have you? She's pointing to the same very thing, you know, that they're basing this on slavery, Thirteenth Amendment slavery. Um, most also restrict or postpone full citizenry rights for felons after they serve their times of incarceration. Only two, Maine and Vermont, restore all rights to felons after serving their sentence. Washington restores voting rights to convicts after serving their sentence, even if they have not paid fines and retribution, because it's unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional. Kentucky allows selected felons to receive instruction and assistance in restoring their voting rights. Florida and Iowa have gave voting rights to felons, but later reversed executive orders to that effect. 6.1 million disenfranchised as of 2016. You know, that's twice the number of people that Donald Trump lost the popular vote by. You know, I hear people talk, oh, she had 3 million more votes. Well, we have electoral college, but, you know, those votes do matter in these various states. So that's 6.1 million who are disenfranchised as of 2016. It is estimated that 6.1 million American citizens were disenfranchised because of felony convictions as of 2016. This number has increased significantly since 1976 when there were 1.7 million. Voting age people that cannot vote because of having been convicted varies from 0% in Maine and Vermont to more than 7% in Alabama, Florida, Kentucky, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Virginia. So, you know, you're leaving out a whole bunch of other states. So, uh, okay. So since most convicts are people of color, whether purposely or not, these laws have served to curtail their vote. Everything I just got through saying. For the people who say voting don't matter. Jail time influences the financial status of this population. Even when ex-convicts become eligible to work, finding work is difficult. There are up to 14 million ex-convicts in our population, 90% male, and increasing fast and increasing fast due to mandatory minimum sentences and our exception 
with incarceration, even for nonviolent crimes. While there are 6.1 million jobs available in our economy, as reported recently, many find it difficult to find work. Currently, about 1% of our population is incarcerated. That is the highest of all industrialized countries. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, there is a whole lot more. Well, it's not a whole lot more, but I, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. And y'all can read, read the rest at uh, btrcommunity.com. Um, and I will just say, you know, voting does matter. If voting didn't matter, they wouldn't be taking people's rights away Right. to vote, you know. Right. This and, is population control in the system of slavery. Right. And, you know, we got, and this is not the single one, anyone out, but I'm just saying names that come to mind. You got the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. We got the Southern Poverty Law Center. We got the Abolitionist Law Center. Uh, Benjamin Crump, he's always in the news connected to some lawsuit that's being filed due to some slave catcher killing somebody. We got all of these different law firms around the world. I mean, around this nation and what have you. And I just don't understand. I have never been to law school. I'm not a dummy. And I I have very high reading comprehension. And I've never been to law school. And I can clearly see lawsuits. And it makes you wonder why these Organizations in these institutions have not pursued this. Max? I'm, I'm hoping that they do pursue it even further, uh, Scotty. You know, we point out a lot of things and we're very much way ahead of our time. We have been talking about this stuff for a very long time now. Not just the length of New Abolitionist Radio. I was an abolitionist before we started New Abolitionist Radio. So was Scotty. It was his idea to say we should put something together on a program to start educating the people about this. But we've been talking about this for a long time. And it's good to see the fruit now where these lawsuits are winning. They're setting precedents. They're pointing out the problems clearly. I'm very glad to see that happen. Uh, yes, I am too, about Max. About this uh, violation of our rights, you know, yes, Scotty. Yeah, and this one, this is why I don't like the term mass incarceration. Currently, about one percent of our population is incarcerated. Does that sound like mass incarceration to you, Max? Not at all. If it were truly mass incarceration, there would be four million more white people in prison. It would be up to 50% of the population or more if we had mass incarceration, regardless of skin color and and all of that good stuff. If we truly had mass incarceration, it would be 51% of the population being incarcerated. But we're not dealing with mass incarceration. We're dealing with slavery. And slavery has always made victims of vulnerable populations. Pre-1865 slavery, the average age of the victim of the transatlantic slave trade was 16 years old. Children, okay? Tribes that weren't able to defend themselves in Africa. Vulnerable populations. And so we're not dealing with mass incarceration. You can't say mass incarceration and there's only 1% of the population that's incarcerated. No, we're dealing with something else, the original evil of the founding of this nation in that slavery. You know, as a poet and writer, I'm very big on words. So I wanted to personally know when this phrase began, who started it, who popularized it, and what it represented. And I did that. Um, and see, as a poet, like I said, these words are, words are important to me. So I found out that the term mass incarceration did not exist until 2009 in reality. Between 2007, at the launch of Twitter, and 2009, there were only four mentions of mass incarceration, only four. Then in 2009, it began, uh, it came out as the uh, tell all about everything. And it was popularized by the book written by Michelle Alexander, (laughs) Mass Incarceration and the New Jim Crow. That popularized it. But what it really did was take you away from the truth. Because she apparently never wanted to go to the root of this is legalized slavery and instead displayed it as the new Jim Crow. So she had to make something up in order to fit where there was something she didn't know about or apparently didn't want to talk about. And that was legalized slavery through the 13th Amendment. So really, she was the result 
of the popularization. I mean, she was the one that popularized the term mass incarceration. And since then, we've seen it applied all the time in regards to what's going on. And as Scotty has clearly pointed out, it, mass incarceration is not a term that fits the situation. It's something somebody made up out of thin air in order to fill a blank that they did not want to discuss or were not aware of. That's the power of media, Max. That's the power of media. It was in her book, and then every time you turn on the television and they're talking about this issue, all the talking heads on your TV screen, mass incarceration, mass incarceration, mass incarceration, mass incarceration. And then that gets in the public's mind. Now the public is saying mass incarceration, mass incarceration, the new Jim Mm -hmm. Crow, the new Jim Crow. Ain't nothing new about racism. And it ain't okay? Jim Crow. <laughs> exactly. Ain't nothing new about racism. And and if you want to talk about Jim Crow, Jim Crow was abolished. That was what, what Dr. King, that's one of the greatest contributions he made. It is illegal not to say these crimes still don't happen, but it's illegal to discriminate against someone based on race, sex, uh, um, uh, national origin, and religion, okay? Jim Crow was the era of the black codes. Now we don't have the black codes. It's about how you apply the law and who you apply it to. So we don't even have a new Jim Crow. What we have is the age-old system of slavery, Max, but that's how it became popularized. The media, the mass media kept drilling that term into the minds of the masses and, and that blinds them to what we're truly dealing with. Otis said it's true that he spoke with her and had her book autographed. Yeah, it is. Yeah, we know. We know where it came from. Like I said, I'm a poet. I want to know what this word means. Who brought this word into existence and why? And and it didn't take much to find out, just a little bit of research. And then it, once you realize that's the case, it really sheds a new light on it, you know? So we're here telling you this is slavery. Somebody else is telling you it's Jim Crow. One of us is wrong. Well, there's a couple of other stories that I want to cover tonight, Scotty, unless you had any more that, uh, stories that you want to hit right now. No, Max, that's the one that really stood out to me. And I Indeed. just want to thank these writers. You know, poets are important. Writers are, are, are important. Words are important. So thank you, Marlo Salazar. I had never heard your name until now, never heard of your publication, but obviously you know the truth about what we're dealing with. So thank you. Amen. Well, Scotty, I put a link in the chat room there for another video. And this video is in regards to uh, a, a brother in Chicago who busted the CPD trying to entrap people. They took a big ass truck, a uh, tractor trailer filled with Nikes, expensive Nikes and, and expensive uh, foot gear and just parked it in uh, the hood or in impoverished areas waiting for people to come and try to rob this truck. And this brother busted them cold. It, and actually, it made them uh, issue a public apology. But let's see if we can get some info out of this video, Scotty. Police across the country routinely use bait traps to try to catch thieves in the act. They set up a tempting bike or a car, and then they watch. But in Chicago last week, the tactic backfired. So y'all see this? Listen, this is live, uncut, unedited bait truck. Charles McKenzie was born and raised in Inglewood in southwest Chicago. So when he saw an unmarked 18-wheeler being parked and reparked around his neighborhood, he knew something was up. They, they sent people up with this truck right there. So this is where you were when you were taking the video with your phone, right? Yes. So you're seeing, what, what are you seeing? Um, as I put up and approached the um, situation, I saw the um, officer putting a young man in the car. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was standing right here, and then I got closer to right here to see what everything was going on. They mm-hmm. parked an empty Nike truck with Nike boxes in the, in the ghetto. What in Charles caught on video was a new program the police had nicknamed Operation Trailer Trap. 
Police from Norfolk Southern Railways loaded the truck with Nike Air Force One sneakers and Christian Louboutin shoes. Three people were arrested for theft in what police call a sting, but neighbors call a setup. Chicago PD said they were only brought in to make arrests, and the charges have since been dropped. We always suspect that the police stage crime in our air, but we've never able to prove it or document it on film. But this particular time, I knew I got it. Live, uncut. Uncut, people, I got it. Y'all know this script. In the black community, uh, we're over police and we have the most crime. So you would think if we have the most police in our community, we should have less crime, but that's not the case. Oh, the young boys gonna jump on this boy, they're gonna be in trouble. The timing of Operation Trailer Trap came right after a weekend in which more than 70 people were shot and at least 12 people died. So it's up to me and my command staff to try and repair those relationships in the community. And we're making progress. Police have said that they need the community's help to solve those crimes. But the bait trucks seem to have hurt police's goal to gain the community's trust. Since the people have seen bait trucks, right. what do you think that's done just around the neighborhood? Oh, man, it's, it have, the antennas have went up like, hey, we can't trust the cops. We can't trust them. Why? Because the cops preach transparency, but you practice something else. In the city of Chicago, we have an 83% murder rate that's unsolved. That same energy could have been used into finding the criminals, the murderers. Norfolk Southern says the bait truck operation was aimed at catching people who've been stealing cargo, including guns and ammunition, from a nearby rail yard. But my whole thing is, if these crimes are happening on your property, why are you bringing it into our community? If you gonna run a sting, be on the, on the freight yard, uh, in y'all yard, and on the railroad tracks, and wait on them. They're gonna come. When you pull up a truck in front of an impoverished community, and you and, and they see that it's an opportunity, come on, who's not gonna take it? You, these people are in survival mode. That's they, crazy. They, yeah. They're crazy. They try to set, up, set us up in our neighborhood. Yeah, that's what they do, man. The videos that were posted online prompted so much outrage that Norfolk Southern eventually apologized, saying that they don't plan to use that method in the future. The railroad police have apologized, and they said that they regret that they made people feel that they couldn't trust police. Well, let me say this to the railroad, and you can take this message back to them. Are you sorry because you got caught? Or are you really sorry that you yeah, should have never done? They, they left a bait truck. Man, Scotty, there's so much about that that pisses me off, man. Well, let's talk about oh, it on the other God. side of the our last break, Max. All right, we'll do that. You're listening to New Abolitionist Radio here on Black Talk Radio Network. And when we come back on the other side, we're going to talk about Chicago creating criminals. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Black Talk Radio, since 2008, providing new black media for the masses. Peace and welcome back to New Abolitionist Radio. Uh, Scotty Reed, it's not so much about that upsets me. Man, first of all, this is a private police company. I mean, it's a oh, Max, railroad we, company's private police. That's company. why you my yep. brother, Max, because we think alike. We on the same wa- mm-hmm. wavelength. When I kept hearing Southern Norfolk, Southern Norfolk police, this is their private police. This isn't the private. Chicago police. This isn't the Illinois State Police. This is the, the a private police. Let me correct my language. This is a private slave catcher force. Go ahead, Max. And they were working with the CPD. The CPD said they were only there to make arrests. So apparently these uh, railroad company rent-a-cops set up this thing to bring these people in and the CPD stood by waiting for them so they could make an arrest. Partner, and, and yeah, public and Man, private partnership. This was a public and private partnership to enslave yes. people. And, to create and, criminals. And the brothers that were speaking, 
was making so much sense. Look, you saying they stealing this, that, and the other from your rail yard, then it seems to me you need better security in your rail yard. Why are you bringing the products out here in, in, in impoverished neighborhoods where people are living in poverty and where you will find crimes of survival, but no, and they named it correctly. They called it a trap, a truck trap. They're, Brother, they know hunting. what they're doing. You know what, man? That community ought to file a lawsuit against uh, uh, Norfolk Southern because let's you know let's look at it in the historical context that convict leasing, which was the beginning of the new form of slavery after the Thirteenth Amendment was passed, the railroads used a whole lot of that convict the labor. Yep, these countries' railroads were built by convicts. Enslaved former former enslaved people and uh, Asians, Chinese people who was con- existing under the same slave labor conditions. But you know, the, yeah, again, Scotty, this thing is just mind blowing. Is and it pisses me off. And you know, they issued an apology, but who the hell wants your apology? Like you said, this is a lawsuit, and it's a shame of what they're doing. Brother Johanan, a uh, former uh, host here on New Abolitionist Radio said that he wished he'd get a tractor trailer full of methamphetamines and roll up in one of these freaking um, middle America communities and leave the door open and see what happened. And that's basically what they're doing. They're coming with Air Force Ones and Nikes in the hood and leaving the freaking door open after pointing out clearly what's inside of it. Hey, that was a setup. There's nobody doing a crime. They're creating criminals. You know, Take a freaking ice cream truck to a, a, day, a, a, a grammar school and leave it unmanned and open and see what happens. You know, I don't know if uh, this is what Otis means by what he posts on the chat room, and then we'll go to our caller, and we have to be cognizant of our time, Max. Uh, We do got another program coming up, but Otis posted, vendors and transport companies are guilty of the bulk of the product. What, What I interpret him to be saying is that that's who's stealing most of the product. That's why you can't catch them. It's because it's an inside job. That's why. And so the very uh, private slave catcher force working for the railroad are probably the very ones who are stealing the product and then want to set up this thing to go trap some people to blame them for what they are the ones doing. Uh, We got several callers, Max. I want to go to the first person, Ra. you are unmuted on the board. Welcome in the New Abolitionist Radio. Go ahead with your question or comment, and then we'll come to 646. Hey, Scotty. I'll make it quick. Um, I think it was Max that mentioned how um, if if someone mentioned if you would take a truck full of anything over into West Virginia, they would sell it. You could, you could take a truck full of syringes over there. They would go in and steal those syringes because of all the uh, opioid addiction. So for them to place this truck in the black neighborhood where they so-called claim all of these gang banging shootings are happening, why wouldn't you just place some type of training center, vocational center? But no, you want to set up some type of trap. So I, I just wanted to say thank you, brothers, for pointing out the fact that that's a private so-called slave catcher company. I mm-hmm. missed that. So great show, brothers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, appreciate your comments. Um, you know, to her point about West Virginia, hell, Gaston County, Gaston County. I live in a predominantly white rural area, and a lot of people here are on food stamps or getting some kind of public assistance. There's not a whole lot of jobs and what have you. And farm equipment, ain't, you know, gets stolen a lot here. Those, you know, ATVs, four-wheelers, stuff like that gets missing. All right, people stealing it because you're living in poverty. And also, you know, we got the opioid problem here too. So, I mean, if you take it to any impoverished neighborhood, this is going to incur, uh, to occur. Um, we got a call from 646, area code 646, you're on New Abolitionist Radio. I believe this may be our abolitionist comrade tag. Yeah, peace. Peace to you both and, and peace to everyone. And, and uh, hear you back, Brother Max. Ideally, you're recovering quickly. Thank you, brother. 
appreciate that. Absolutely. I, I, I echo the sentiments of the sister who just called in. Um, shouts to her. And I, too, will keep it brief. Just, you know, I, I totally hear and uh, appreciate and uh, agree with the outrage that was expressed around that report, um, having seen and also having seen the report that you put Brother Scotty, around uh, similar tactics, dropping uh, firearms into uh, housing areas, and um, we see this we see this all the time, and it connects with the demonization of street families that goes on when simultaneously we have the state and these uh, private interests in this, uh, you know, so-called uh, public-private partnership, essentially stoking the flames and even just off creating uh, this so-called criminal that seems to be the only thing that the U.S. is capable of, of producing out here is uh, criminality and enslavement. And so um, I, I appreciate y'all, y'all putting that out there and this brother documenting this longstanding history real time and I would just you know to give a local sense of it out here in New York they do the same thing I have heard direct accounts of this thing happening not only with the kind of you know devious uh, manipulation of street families and trying to provoke conflict among streets but also with this kind of uh, baiting activity entrapment, uh, specifically as regards these um, city bikes out here. And I've had, you know, a number of, you know, speak to me directly about, about that is of using those as bait to uh, jail people and, and potentially enslave on prison plantations. So it, it's, it's totally happening out here. Uh, that's, that's just, you know, a, a, a local um, accounting of that same type of tactic and appreciate it and pardon for running longer than I was trying to. Understand cool. brother. Thank you, uh, brother tag for your contribution. You know, they had a TV series for over a decade called bait car where they did this on a regular basis. So this really isn't new. They're doing this all over the country uh, on a regular basis. It, it, it Max, again, you just talked traffic. about, I'm sorry, another revenue stream. Remember I was talking about these cop shows and, you know, Netflix and, you know, with with Monique going into the prisons to do some comedy and then a bunch of money being made off of that. You know, again, man, the tentacles of slavery run run all over. I mean, it's like a spider web, man. All these little intersections of slavery all throughout society. But one thing, though, that the brother touched on, and see, that go to show you black life don't matter to them cops. And I'm talking about Chicago police because, like the brother said, we have a 84% unsolved murder rate. But yet you out here working with these private slave catchers to set people up with. How how can you justify that allocation of man hours? Why isn't those resources going towards solving these murders? Because they don't care. They don't care. But but to something Tag said reminded me of something that I picked up from the video. Now, we've seen the video. Some of us have seen the video where some gang members were saying that crates of guns were being dropped off in right. Chicago, right? So mm -hmm. what I heard in that video yep. is that you are bringing in guns and ammunition on these railroad cars and you're leaving them unguarded. Because I would right. think if you had guns and ammunition that it'd be 24 surveillance, it would be armed guards standing outside the rail car. Mm hmm You heard it too. And I, I picked heard that, I I wanted picked to comment that up. on that too when I got a chance. I picked that up. Yep. This was they were trying to cover it up in a way, like saying, here's the reason. We're blaming it on these people. They don't stole these guns. When you left these freaking guns on a in this on this trail train car unguarded. Um let's take the uh call from Sister Black Rose again. Sister Black Rose. Yes. I don't mean to be a pest, but, you know, I just love the conversation here. I just have to chime in. Um, I remember years ago when I lived in Memphis, 
I knew people that knew about the trains that would come through the neighborhoods and they would collect all types of jackets. I don't know if you guys remember those like Mickey Mouse jackets people were wearing. Mm -hmm. Anything that was out, anything, any clothing or shoes that were popular, the trains would come through the neighborhood and people would take the items from the it was it was known it was like that was common that's how people were able to you know go into beauty salons and sell all of these different supplies so this is something that they've always done in our communities unload all of these materials including the guns because like we used to say we don't make any guns we don't grow any poppy seeds so how is all of this getting into our neighborhoods anyway Exactly. They turned our communities into shopping malls of human bodies where they can come in at any time and snatch up as many as they want. But I, I just want to re-emphasize the point now. You you talking about all this gun violence in Chicago, and I got to mention the good news with the gang truce in North Chicago who have, with eight months, violence-free and even the rival gangs working together to build a playground for the children but, you know, with this level of violence that's going on and people talking about where are these gu- how are these guns, people going across to these other states and bringing these guns in. No, you just heard in that report where all those guns are coming from. And I will emphasize once again, if I know I got all these guns and ammunition in this train car, why would I leave it unguarded? Why would I leave it unguarded? I, I, I'm telling you it's something there. Yeah, this needs to be investigated further, This uh, certainly. But you know the results of this, Scotty, is the bottom line is that one in three black males will go to prison in their lifetime. That's just the black males. That's not talking about the other races because they will go to prison as well. We have 2.4 million people in our prison systems and 12 million go through our jail systems every year. That's just counting those two things. It's like 24 million people a year that are processed by this system. That is a statement of genocide. I don't even know how our our family members can sit down with their sons and say, you know, son, they're going to try to kill you. One in three of you are going to prison. I got three sons, so I'm likely going to lose one of you. How do you tell that to your children? How do you even come out your mouth to say it? And then you live the life knowing that this is the case. Man. I don't know, Scotty. I don't know. Now, what but I would like in. to know what what is the statistic of Americans? Okay, they say one in one hundred, Scott. Scotty, one in one hundred. Uh, at one point, it was one in eighty-seven. That was in two thousand and fourteen. Maybe it might be still a one in eighty-seven. I tell you, man, people need to wake up. Well, that's the fallacy of average when we talk about all of America, because all of America is not. Ex, uh, experiencing this equally. Uh, many right, it's small affirmative communities action. provide the most prisoners. Affirmative action for African Americans and other non-white people and of course you got to have white sacrifice so that's the poor white people. Right. Well Scotty we are running so much out of town, time and we still got two uh, segments to cover. You want to go ahead and get into that? Uh, sure. Uh, what What do you want me to start with? Do um, you want to real uh, quick, Max? Do Max, do you want Excuse to me? real uh, quickly go through the headlines that um, is on the cutting room floor and just you know briefly go over those yes. headlines? Yes. Uh, there's a number of things that I did want to put out there. One that you talked about last week uh, when you were here uh, in regards to Puerto Rico sending 3,200 prisoners thousands of miles away. Uh, I'd like to point out that that is the human trafficking that we talk about here on this program all the time, where these prisons are just shipping bodies all across the country as if they are a little nation. And as long as you're in CCA or GO's prisons, you're okay. And that's not the way it works. That is human trafficking. Uh, One of the other things that I want to to point out to people about the brother that got shot in his back recently where he, you know, he's running away from this cop. He's no threat at all. And the policeman stops as if he's out of breath, said, I'm tired of running after this guy. So boom, shoots him in the back three times and kills him. And this was a brother who was the sole provider for his blind mother. 
and they shot him in the back and killed him. And apparently there's some kind of law or policy all across America that if you run from a police, they can shoot you in the back and murder you. And I think this is just outrageous, and that case needs to be highlighted. So that's just two of the things on the cutting room floor. Uh, They're available in our planning stage on the abolitionist page at the BTR community. Um, Scotty, anything that you want to cover just before we do? Oh, there was one other thing. I'm sorry, Scotty. And that's I've been doing some research and I found some jewels about mass incarceration, quote unquote, and how it has expanded. And I, I was researching and found that in 1971, there were 191,000 men in prison and 6,000 women. That was 1971 at the start of the war on drugs slash war on blacks. Look at today. That prison population has increased by 12-fold, 12-fold, but the population itself, which was 207 million in 1971, has not increased two times. But the prison population has increased 12 times. It's just outrageous. And that information is also available on New Abolitionist Radio with a full study of that period. Mm-hmm. All right, that's about it. For, oh, almost get Scotty I keep forgetting these things one more thing I want to let people know is I've been asked to be a content contributor for No Biz Magazine which is located in Columbia South Carolina and uh, my first of my regular contributions will be a nine part video series featuring myself Tribal Rain and Thomas Washington where we recited the denouncement of uh, by Frederick Douglass, where he denounced the emancipation as a stupendous fraud. It's an amazing nine-part series, and you got to see it. That'll be available on No Biz Mag at via No Biz Mags with a Z at the end dot com. All right, Scotty, there you go. All right, I will um, take our get into our final segments. Max, I'll take the abolitionists if you uh, could pull up our writer. Yes. All right. Our abolitionist in profile tonight is Benjamin Rush, 1746 to 1813. The most prominent American physician of the late 18th century, Dr. Benjamin Rush was also a patriot leader who signed the Declaration of Independence and served as a Surgeon General of the Continental Army. His interest in abolitionism began in the early 1770s when fellow Philadelphian Anthony uh, Benazet inspired him to pen a critique of slavery titled An Address to the Inhabitants of the British Settlements in America Upon Slave Keeping. Approaching the subject with a scientist's eye, Russ stressed that blacks had the same natural intelligence as their white counterparts and that education and emancipation were needed to undo the damage done by slavery. When the American Revolution ended, Rush was among the many patriots who believed the principles of the new republic left no room for slavery. It would be useless for us to denounce the servitude to which the Parliament of Great Britain wishes to reduce us, he once wrote. While we continue to keep our fellow creatures in slavery just because their color is different. He joined the Pennsylvania Abolition Society in the 1780s, serving first as his secretary and then as president and later made arrangements to free his lone slave. Rush also took steps to lift up Philadelphia's free black community, including raising money for African churches and enlisting the help of black nurses during a 1793 yellow fever epidemic. And New Abolitionist Radio salutes abolitionist Benjamin Rush. Salute. Benjamin Rush said, slavery is so foreign to the human mind that the moral faculties, as well as those of the understanding, are debased and rendered torpid by it all of the vices which are charged upon the Negroes in the Southern colonies and West Indies are the genuine offspring of slavery and serve as an argument to prove that they, African Americans, were not intended by Providence for it. Benjamin Rush. You know, for Uh, those apologists of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, the quote-unquote founding slavers, um, you know, I hear people say, as an excuse, hey, that was just, they were just men of their time. Well, that suggests that there were no people in the world who 
saw this as a moral evil, who saw it exactly as they should see it. So there's no no room for excuses of, oh, they were just men of their time. Well, you had abolitionists doing their time as well. (laughs) Right. All right, Mm -hmm. next. All right, our abolition, I mean, our writer of the 21st century underground today is Robert Seth Hayes, a member of the Black Panthers Party, BPP, and Black Liberation Army in the United States. He's been released on parole after 45 years in prison for murdering a New York City transit officer in 1973. The parole commissioner recognizes his progress after serving 45 years in prison and granted his parole application at the 11th parole hearing. A statement from the New York City Jericho movement reads, he is looking forward to being reunited with his family and friends. We welcome him home. We spoke with Seth today and he is grateful to all his friends and supporters. Once he gets settled in, he plans to write a statement of his own. Despite his good behavior and being eligible for parole since 1998, Hayes has been denied 10 times due to his political background and ideology before finally being released. He is one of the few revolutionaries and members of Black Liberation organizations that have been granted freedom. Many of his comrades are still behind bars and others have died there. Hayes was born in 1947 and grew up in different neighborhoods of New York City, learning from different realities of the African-American community. He served in the Vietnam War, was wounded, and received several military awards. He joined BPP after his unit was ordered to help pacify the social movements that followed after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. It was the saddest day of my life, says Hayes, and I could never identify again with the aims of the armed forces of the U.S. government. In 1973, Hayes was convicted of the murder of police officer Sidney Thompson, other attempted murders, multiple counts of robbery, weapons possession, and collective association, and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. The parole board had denied him parole until now, arguing he remained a threat to society. He was finally granted freedom on his 11th parole hearing on July 24th of this year. And we here at New Abolitionist Radio want to say, welcome to freedom, Brother Seth. Welcome to freedom, freedom fighter. Indeed, man, 45 years. Well, that covers it, Scotty. Any quick final comments before we close it? I prematurely (laughs) started to outro music. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry about that. Um, Yes. Um, my final thoughts are, you know, this is depressing work and it just gets to you. And when you have to report on these stories time after time after time after time, but somebody's got to do it and somebody's got to do it and put it in the right context. And so, you know, I, I'm still, still uh, happy about reading that other article by Mrs. Uh, Salazar. Um, who clearly pointed out that mass incarceration is a farce. There's only 1% of the population who is incarcerated and that the 13th Amendment did not abolish slavery. We were not seeing articles like this when we started uh, New Abolitionist Radio six years ago, and that's why um, it was impressed upon my spirit to start it and to find people to help tell this story to help put this truth out into the universe and you know uh, um, I've come across Max and he's been a constant presence here and we've had several guests over the years so I'm saying all of that to say that progress is being made so let's not get too depressed let's not get too down in the dumps about these stories because it is the truth is coming to light and I will have to think that, you know, once people see the truth, that they will be moved to act. Thank you, Scotty. I would like to uh, say I that think all this to wants the to Young say Turks something real video quick. we listened okay, to, there were two statements said. One, they said that these are offender-funded fees. They also said that judges benefit from the fees in the same way that law enforcement benefits from asset seizure laws. Y'all, Come on, you should know. Abolition is a reason for a revolution. So we can finally know some peace. Peace. Rise up, 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 rise up,
lift your eyes up. Let your wise rise up. See the signs of the times. If it's time, rise up, rise up. When death and hell dwell among all God's people, when those we chose and trusted have become completely corrupted and inherently evil, when the feast that feeds you starves our father's children, when snuff porn and pedo forms begin to get top billing, rise up. When famine claims millions, when justice gives blind eyes to billions, when the Lord's anger is no longer feared. If his protection is gone and your enemies are near If you've seen the seas spill over And the mountains shake, break and fall If the moon ever turns blood red And you can't see the sun at all Rise up, no matter if the prize is high in the skies Or deep